more studies. We don't need any more commissions. We don't need more, any more meetings. We need reparations. We need reparations today. We need reparations now. And that is what this lawsuit is about. The beauty of it, and you're going to hear from these very powerful legal minds, is that it is a public nuisance case that is well understood and been used in Oklahoma for 100 years. We have a very strong case. Obviously, we're not the judge. The judge will make the decision if we can move forward. But we fully believe, firmly believe, 100% believe that we should be able to move forward this case and finally show what it will actually take to abate this nuisance. So you're going to hear from everyone up here. The first person is my good friend, Eric Miller, who was actually a part of the, lit the litigation in the early 2000s when all these people you see on the wall here were still alive. And they were still our living clients. And all these people on this wall are now deceased. And they all died without justice. It's one of the reasons we wanted to be in this room today. Because we have three living survivors. And we're going to do everything we can in our power to make sure they do not die without justice. So Professor Eric Miller from Loyola Marymount will be your first speaker after me. Thank you very much, DeMario. Uh, again, I'm uh, Professor Eric Miller from Loyola Marymount University. So in Dred Scott versus Sanford, the infamous slavery case decided in 1857, Chief Justice Taney stated that black people, quote, had for more than a century been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with a white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, end quote. Right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the defendants in this litigation, which include the city of Tulsa and its Chamber of Commerce, but also the state of Oklahoma as well, have acted as if Justice Tawney's pronouncement were still the law of the land and have treated the people of Greenwood and North Tulsa, along with the descendants of the Tulsa Race Massacre, as second-class citizens, not worthy of respect or rights. However, the people of Greenwood and North Tulsa will not be disrespected. The people of Greenwood and North Tulsa will have their rights to live as equal citizens in neighborhoods and communities that have all the features and amenities that allow them to determine for themselves how their lives are to grow and to flourish. When I got the call almost two years ago from attorney Demario Solomon Simmons to join in this latest fight for justice for the people of Greenwood and North Tulsa, I was heartened to hear that this was a lawsuit whose innovative legal ideas were developed in Tulsa by Demario along with his team of Spencer Bryan and Stephen Terrell. For 18 months, we worked diligently developing these legal claims. We brought on board invaluable legal assistance from Lashandra Peoples Johnson and Cordell Cephas to broaden and deepen our Tulsa-based and Tulsa-strong legal team, along with help from Maynard Henry and myself, and a huge amount of help uh, from uh, uh, numerous people working behind the scenes uh, here in Tulsa. These are people with deep connections to the neighborhood and community they represent many of them descendants themselves. And of course, we've been joined and bolstered and strengthened in recent months by the SRZ uh, law firm who have taken up the challenge of filing our second complaint and these motions to dis and uh, uh, rebutting these motions to dismiss as you're uh, about to hear. Over the past 18 months, uh, we spent countless hours researching and drafting the first complaint which we filed in 2020. I think I can say that I've read every single book on the Tulsa Race Massacre, at least the factual ones, <laughs> ever written, although uh, my recent experience uh, down here has convinced me that in the coming weeks and months, there's a few more that I'm going to have to add to my reading list. What I've learned reading the books, speaking to the survivors and descendants, and just walking around Greenwood is the depth of the continuing harm that still impacts this community. We've heard a lot about that from DeMario. But it's sometimes been hard to convince people of the economic, cultural, 
and psychological trauma that still haunts Greenwood and North Tulsa. Communities around the country who are happy to commemorate their own culture's trauma, who tell their own tales of devastation, exodus and famine, inexplicably find it hard to believe that African Americans suffered in this way. That is why this lawsuit is so important, because it charts the ongoing links between the cultural, physical, economic and psychic violence of 1921 and the cultural, physical, economic and psychic violence of 2021. What is truly innovative about these lawsuits was not the nature of the legal claim, but the fact that we are demanding that the same law that has been applied to others is applied to the African American survivors and descendants of Greenwood and North Tulsa. Yesterday, the President spoke the truth and justice of our claims. Today, we hope the courts will recognize that truth and give us that justice. Because only then can Greenwood and North Tulsa itself live in, in truth and justice with equal rights and respect for all its citizens and the great diaspora of descendants who look to this place as a beacon of hope and seek to call it home once again. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Uh, the next part of our legal team that you're going to hear from is a person that's become a very good friend. All these folks on this stage are standing beside me. We've come very close because as Eric stated, we've been working on this for such a long time. We meet weekly, uh, and it's just been a great experience to see people just dive in unselfishly and say this is something that is important and important to us as an organization, but also important as people. You know, I've, done a, I've been practicing law for 17 years. I've dealt with a lot of lawyers, and as lawyers, we have big egos and lots of opinions. Everybody wants to talk, but the beauty of this project is that people have come together and said we're all focused on these survivors and descendants, and part of that, from the SRZ standpoint, is this, this young man standing next to me, Michael Swartz, who is one of the top commercial litigators in the entire world, not the nation, in the entire world, and he's come in and brought his team in, and they have just mailed with us and they care so much. They've been on ground here. They wanted to come see. They didn't have to do this. And they've spent, and I'm sure Michael will talk more about it, but I want to say how thankful we are. They've spent millions of dollars in time working on this case. They have lots of attorneys, and Michael's going to talk about it. But that's why we feel so confident, because we finally, for the first time, we have the firepower, we have the resources for the long haul. So. Uh, Michael, I'm so glad you're here. I appreciate you and your firm so much, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Michael Swartz. I'm co-chair of the Schulte Roth and Zabel Litigation Department. We are a New York-based firm with over 300 lawyers in Washington, New York, and London. Um, we have a strong history of social justice activism, and we felt it was particularly important to use our law degrees, our privilege of being lawyers, to help and contribute to lifting black Americans and help society seek access to justice. We, we believe that it's important for the future of racial justice litigation for law, large law firms like ours to assist in cases like these to seek change. As President Biden said in this building yesterday, if you lift one person up, you lift everyone up, and we strongly, strongly believe that. I want to talk a minute about how we got involved. It was a relationship that grew and blossomed over time. We are doing this on a pro bono basis. We're contributing our time to the community. And a few months ago, we received a call from Brian Stevenson of Equal Justice Initiative, who was also a pro bono client of the firm. And he said that there was a group in Tulsa seeking help with regard to the misappropriation of images that had been used from the massacre for uh, fundraising purposes and for commercial purposes, and could we lend our expertise in intellectual property issues to the cause? We said not only would we be happy to do that, we also asked if there was anything else we could do. And uh, the rest is, is history. We, we really, uh, really got involved. Um, and I'll say as a note, I want to talk a little bit about our involvement, but I first thought about this as helping out the Tulsa community, the African American community in Tulsa, but that's not it. It's, it's helping out my community. It's helping out America and all yes. Americans and, and humans. So yes. uh, this, this, this case has taught me a lot. 
Working with DeMario and his team has taught me a lot. This has been an amazing experience. Uh, I want to briefly talk about my firm's involvement. Um, in this case, we have 12 lawyers from my firm alone, and uh, we heard from Eric about the many other lawyers who've been involved as well. In total, we have 30 lawyers and 20 business staff from my firm who have been working on not only this litigation, but also with Justice for Greenwood. We worked on this litigation. We have brought a number of Public Records Act cases, trying to get to the bottom of who perpetrated these crimes, what happened, and we have filed, I, I don't know the number, but a large number of Public Records Act cases at this point in time. We have been assisting in identifying the insurance companies who denied the Greenwood community the recovery on their claims that prevented them from rebuilding their community. We're helping identify the banks, and we've helped identify the banks, who refused the black citizens of Tulsa from being able to take out their deposits because they didn't have their identification that had been destroyed in the massacre. We have helped the survivors and, and others with their trust and estate plannings and helping them with their wills. We have helped Justice for Greenwood in corporate governance and in fundraising, and our business staff has helped with the Senate outreach. So we are, as a firm, very committed to this project, and we could not be happier. At this point in time, and I think this is only the beginning, I hope this is only the beginning, we've contributed 3,000 3, hours of time, lawyer time, to this project, uh, and that, can, can, that translates to 2.5 million in legal services that we've donated to this community. And again, our community, but to this project. Thank you. Uh, with regard to this case, I just want to briefly touch on why we needed such a big team in terms of the numbers. There are, excuse me, I think that was going to happen. Um, we have, uh, th there are eight defendants in this case, and together they filed seven separate motions to dismiss. There were seven different sets of legal papers we had to respond to within a 60-day period. And those briefs totaled 117 pages. And so it took an army of lawyers to put together the complex legal arguments that uh, Rand Randall Adams and Mackenzie Haynes from my firm will describe in a little more detail. But I just want to say from my perspective, from a top line level, I absolutely second what DeMario said. We are confident, and again, it is for the judge to decide, but we are confident that we should prevail in defeating these motions to dismiss. We should have an opportunity to take discovery to get to the bottom of what happened here and to prove our claims in court. And we look forward to that opportunity. And when we get that opportunity, we intend to bring the full resources of our firm to bear on getting to the bottom of the truth and proving our case. And so with that, I will turn it over to Randall Adams or Mackenzie Haynes to talk about the details of the case in a little more granularity. Great. Thank you, Michael. I'm a little short, so let me uh, make sure you all can hear me. Uh, oh, jeez. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so as Michael said, my name is Mackenzie Haynes, and uh, I'm an attorney with Schultz E. Roth. Um, it has been a pleasure to work with you, DeMario, and your team. Uh, it has been a pleasure to represent the survivors and descendants of this litigation. And one thing I will say um, is our survivors were victims and witnesses to the worst act of domestic terrorism that this country has ever seen. They're witnesses to murder, to arson, to other heinous crimes. And because, of course, the United States doesn't have a domestic terrorism statute, which is a, a big problem, um, and the state of Oklahoma, the city of Tulsa, has yet to call a grand jury to investigate the crimes in this case. We are in a unique position to try to find a legal remedy that works. And we are blessed to be in Tulsa, to be in Oklahoma, where there is a unique public nuisance statute, which will give us the opportunity to seek justice. Um, so, for a hundred years, survivors and descendants have tried and tried again to seek access to justice in the courts, and they have been denied repeatedly. In 2003, as Eric uh, talked about briefly and Demario talked about briefly, 
a federal case was filed and the court shot it down. They said it was too late. They said, sorry, your claims, we can't hear them. We're not gonna equitably toll the statute. It doesn't matter that you have not obtained justice. We're just gonna let this pass. And that's not okay. So because we are in Oklahoma, we are in Tulsa, we have a public nuisance statute that will allow for a remedy. And the public nuisance statute here is unique. It is broad. As Michael mentioned, the state of Oklahoma, the city of Tulsa, they provided us with a test case in the opioid litigation. And we plan to use, and we have used in our, in our responses, the exact methodology and principles that the state used in their case. So let me talk about why we think this is a public nuisance. And DeMario talked about it a little bit. On May 31st, 1921, the white mobs came in and they murdered, they destroyed, they killed, they looted, they rioted, and a public nuisance was created. After that moment, it continued and continued and continues to this day. We believe that the massacre ignited the nuisance that exists today in Tulsa, specifically in North Tulsa, and all of the policies and practices that have been implemented by the defendants have elevated and exacerbated the public nuisance. For example, urban renewal. These policies pushed black people out of their homes. It made them poorer than their white neighbors. A highway was constructed right, right over there, cutting North Tulsa away from South Tulsa, taking resources, opportunity, the health disparities that have continued as a result. There's no hospital, by the way, as all of you know, I'm sure, in North Tulsa. That was, I think, it's probably the most profound thing that I recall uh, DeMario talking about was just that there's no hospital in this vicinity. But there was in 1921, and it has not been rebuilt. And that is a nuisance. Um, there's so many other things that have happened, the educational disparities, all these things are part of the public nuisance that continues today. And because we have a test case, because we have uh, the state and the city of Tulsa who have demonstrated that acts such as uh, these, societal injustices, that they can be remedied through the statute, we believe that we are right on the law in order to equate the societal injustice of the massacre and its continuing harm to uh, this case. Another claim that we have is our unjust enrichment claim. And we believe that we are absolutely right on the law on this. As you can see behind us today, not in this building, but there's a, a new museum coming up. And the names and the stories and the images of all of these descendants and survivors and their stories are being told. And the people who have suffered are not reaping any of the benefits as a result. There is cultural tourism that is being created in Tulsa, and that's wrong. And people should be compensated if their stories and their images and their likenesses are going to be used without their permission, particularly. It's particularly egregious. And so we are asking for our defendants to stop, to, uh, give up all of the, the resources that they have achieved or received as a result of using the likenesses and names and images of survivors and descendants and giving it back to the people who it belongs to. And so let me also close with this and just tell you what we're asking for. You know, our, our, uh, our defendants claim that we are uh, asking to cure society of racism in our claims. It's absurd. We all know that that's not something that's easily overcome and we're not asking for that. What we're asking for is for the nuisance to be abated. Right. Simple as that. The nuisance is specific 
here in Tulsa. It is targeted to Tulsa. It is related to the massacre that happened in Tulsa. And we want the remedy to be here for the folks that deserve it. We want a victim's compensation fund. We want the survivors and the descendants to have the opportunity to be compensated for the harm that they have endured for the last hundred years and continue to, to endure. As I mentioned before, we want a hospital built in North Tulsa. We want educational resources provided back to the community. We want taxes to, uh, you know, the, the, the folks who have experienced this in the community, the, the black Tulsans who live and endure the continuing harm, to not have to pay any more state and local taxes because they have been denied justice for so long. Their economic justice has been taken from them. And we believe that it is only fair to not have them have to spend their resources to give it back to the state or the city or the county that has, has taken so much from them. So I will close um, just with this. Again, it was, it's been an honor to be a part of this litigation. Um, we believe we are right on the law and uh, we're hoping for our day in court. Randall. Thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, my name is Randall Adams. I'm a special counsel at Schulte, Roth & Zabel in New York. Uh, and uh, I'll echo what, what Mackenzie said. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to work with DeMario and his team. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here in Tulsa uh, for the events of this weekend. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, where we are right now in the case and in the motions that are pending before the court and our responses to those motions. So on March 12th of this year, all of our defendants filed motions to dismiss our case. A motion to dismiss basically is asking the judge to say, this case stops right now. They don't even get a trial. They don't get a hearing. They don't get a motion for summary judgment. We don't need evidence. This case just doesn't work from the jump. We are opposing that motion, obviously, and we should win those motions. Here in Oklahoma, uh, it's a pleading, uh, a notice pleading jurisdiction, which means that our burden right now is to put defendants on notice, notice of the claims against them, then we go into discovery, then we have a trial. The defendants are on notice of the claims against them. They cannot claim right now not to know what conduct is at issue, not to know what they're supposed to defend. They know that. It's very clear in the extensive amended petition that was filed, and we should win these motions. The day in court is a really important idea here. Uh, as Mackenzie uh, mentioned, um, the state of Oklahoma has used the very same statute, the very same legal theory in a landmark lawsuit against dozens of pharmaceutical companies claiming that a statewide decades long opioid addiction crisis is a public nuisance that needs to be abated. It's the same theory, we modeled our case off of that. And you know what the state got? The state got a 33-day trial with 42 witnesses and 800 exhibits. They got a chance to prove their case in court. We're asking the court for the same opportunity. We want a trial, we want to call witnesses, we'll bring experts in. As Michael mentioned, we're gonna bring our, the full power of our firm and all of our co-counsel to that trial. And we want a chance to prove to our court and to Tulsa and to the United States, this is a public nuisance, this is how it needs to be abated. And, and by the way, the state won that trial. It's not just that they had, it's not just that they had a trial, they won that trial. We're confident we're gonna win that trial too. And on the, and the motions before the court, we should, we should absolutely get our trial. What's really interesting is obviously, how can the state argue that this isn't a public nuisance when they just made the same arguments in a trial that happened 18 months ago? Well, what the defendants have done is they've enlisted the Chamber of Commerce, which is the only non-government defendant in our case, to make all of these arguments for them. But all of these arguments have already been rejected in the opioid litigation. For example, this, uh, the Chamber of Commerce argues that uh, to have a public nuisance, it can only be about property. It can only be about backyards and fences and things like that. 
the state made uh, the defendants in the state's opioid case made the exact same argument and it was rejected there it should get rejected here similarly uh, the chamber argues that the nuisance statute is just it's too vague it's too it's no one understands what it means it's so vague that it's unconstitutional the pharmaceutical company defendants made the same argument in the opioid litigations and that argument was rejected all of those arguments should be rejected here. These motions should be denied for the reasons in our opposition briefs. Uh, there's a few other arguments I'll talk about. For example, the defendants are claiming that this case was brought too late, but um, and so they're using a theory called latches. But in Oklahoma, under this very specific special public nuisance law, a public nuisance is a vindication of a public right. There is no statute of limitations. It says specifically in the statute, there you are never too late to bring this case as long as the nuisance is ongoing. There, sh there is no latches issue here. They're also arguing that uh, we are supposed to have brought the case through something called the Governmental Tort Claims Act. Uh, that also doesn't apply to this case. There's, uh, we extensively go through this in all of our oppositions. Uh, we're bringing a case for uh, an equitable remedy. We're not seeking actual money damages as that's defined in the law. Uh, and so we didn't have to go through the Government Tort Claims Act. Um, for all of those reasons, these motions should be denied. And again, what we're asking for at this stage is just for our clients who include, who include the last three remaining survivors to have their day in court, just like the state did in the opioid litigations, and we should get that. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Thank you. All right, so we have a few uh, people that's come in, uh, and we have another uh, speaker that I want to introduce. Um, I definitely want to recognize my, my sister, my, my partner in this fight, uh, someone who is on the front lines and has just been here in, in Tulsa and has made such a difference in our community, who put on the Black Wall Street Legacy Festival. Um, she's the executive director, the founder and executive director of the Terrence Crutcher Foundation. And without her, uh, we wouldn't be here today. And that's obviously, I'm talking about Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, who uh, does not have a voice <laughs> this morning. <laughs> but give it up for Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. Uh, she, uh, we, we stand together and we have, with great pride and honor, been able to work together on these initiatives. Uh, so many in this city have tried to divide us. They've tried to, um, they've slandered us. They've attacked us, uh, but we stand strong and we stand together to see victory uh, for our community and our people. And another reason why we know we're going to see victory is this, this woman right here, <laughs> Sarah Salfinelli, who is a, uh, she, she's my, no, I think uh, Angela Rod said she ride or die. <laughs> and you don't normally say that with, with a high powered New York attorney, uh, but we say that with great pride. That she's, a, she's a ride or die, and she's been in here uh, fighting with us. She's co counsel on the case, but she's also my lawyer <laughs> as the corporate lawyer of the Justice for Greenwood Foundation. So, uh, Sarah, do what you do. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to speak, but uh, microphone. So uh, I, I would just echo what my what my colleagues Michael and, and Randall and Mackenzie have said. Um, it's a great honor. We are so grateful and appreciative, Dr. Crutcher, Demario, to uh, be given the opportunity to represent the survivors and descendants, to work with the Greenwood community to access justice. Um, and uh, I, as we've been here, we've met some of our, our clients, we've met with many descendants, and, and the descendant came up and said to me, I'm in my 70s, I don't think I'll see justice, but I, but I hope it comes someday. And I said, what are you talking about? This is not over. We are here. If you've just heard these claims in this lawsuit, I've been watching. There's been so much news coverage this past week, and a lot of it has said uh, reparations. Maybe, maybe Congress will do something. Maybe the city council will do something. We're doing something. The community is doing something. Right. We're not waiting. It is June 2nd. I don't know what will happen with the news coverage. It may be gone, but we will be here. Schulte Roth and Zabel is here, our co-counsel, this legal team. We're not going anywhere. As we've made clear, we, we are just getting started. So it has been a great honor, and we look forward to victory together and, and bringing justice to Greenwood and to communities everywhere.
Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Demaria. I definitely want to acknowledge uh, some folks uh, that could not be here today. Um, uh, Eric talked about uh, Spencer, uh, Brian, and, and uh, Stephen Terrell, who are actual classmates of mine from middle school and high school. We do a lot of cases together, and they have been with me on this journey from the very beginning. He also talked about uh, some young lawyers that we brought on. Because, see, when I was coming, I was a young lawyer. I was a law student when I met Eric, in fact and then became a baby lawyer working with Eric and Johnny Cochran and Professor Charles Ogletree. And it's important for us to bring on that next generation of lawyers in this fight. And Cordell Cephas and LaShandra Peoples-Johnson, they have been outstanding uh, to work with. Maynard Henry, who's out of Virginia, a longtime civil rights attorney uh, who couldn't be here today. Uh, and then uh, people behind the scenes, uh, like um, Greta that's here, and Jerrica, and Chad, and Yolanda Trees, and Jordan, and DJ. Uh, these are people that have been working tirelessly uh, to make this happen. And of course, I have to mention my beautiful, talented, Mariah, marvelous wife, Mia Fleming, uh, who has to stay, be with me 24 hours a day, <laughs> which is a difficult task. I also want to thank, um, Michael mentioned all the lawyers at SRZ uh, who were involved, but I definitely want to highlight one. Um, the firm is Schulte, Rolf, Zabel, and Bill Zabel, uh, uh, who's one of the founding uh, members of the firm. He's 82 years old. He's a civil rights icon. Some of you are familiar with the Levin versus Virginia case, which allowed um, interracial marriages. Bill Zabel wrote the brief, and, and he's an uber-successful lawyer. And he is passionate about justice for Greenwood. You know, we had a, a conference call a couple of weeks ago, and it was a long conference call. Um, and Bill Zabel stayed on the yep. call the whole time, yep. two and a half hours. And this I is a guy video. on video. <laughs> this is a guy that uh, could be doing anything in the world that he wants to do. And he called me and he said, Demario, you're not utilizing me enough. I want to make this happen. And so I just want to uh, tell Bill we thank him and thank his firm. I definitely also want to, I want to recognize something that a miraculous that happened on the 31st, something that had never happened in 100 years of this issue. The National Guard apologized for their role in the destruction of Greenwood. Just in September of 2020, when we filed our case, the National Guard came out and said, hey, we didn't have anything to do with it. If it wasn't for us, it would have been worse. But on May 31st, because of this litigation, because of the work that this team and this community has done, the National Guard showed up, said, we're sorry, we didn't do our jobs, we should have done better, and we're sorry about it. And we want to acknowledge the National Guard uh, for saying that. And we also put that in their brief. <laughs> so the judge knows <laughs> that they admitted that. Mm -hmm. We also want to acknowledge that we saw that the city of Tulsa, Mayor Bynum, said, yeah, the city of Tulsa, you know, we shouldn't have done this. But we want to be, make it clear. It was not a full-throated acknowledgement that needs to happen. He's still talking about what we can't be responsible for what criminals did 100 years ago. These people, they did criminal acts, but they were acting under the authority and the direction of the city. They were acting within the scope of the employment of the city. So they were, yeah, they were criminals, but for, legally, they were doing what they were told by the city. So he's still trying to give the city cover. They have no cover. They are responsible. We would not accept any empty resolutions. We will not accept any empty rhetoric, empty promises. We need to see justice with this litigation and the other cases that Michael talked about. And we have other strategies that if they do not want to do the right thing, we have an army of lawyers and academics and now elected officials, national civil rights organizations, Color of Change, Equal Justice Initiative with Brian Stevenson, Cheryl and Eiffel with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Human Rights Watch, Nicole Austin Hillary, and their wonderful team, Jerry Johnson is here, who's been working with us for over two years. They're with us. Uh, Angela Rye, the Congressional Black Caucus has already said they're going to bring us back, bring me back next week or the next couple of weeks to continue to work on this. 
Congresswoman Maxine Waters is already committed to having hearings with the banks and the financial institutions. Congressman, uh, Congress, uh, Congressman Hank Johnson out of Georgia has already filed legislation that many members are going to file on or sign on as, as co-sponsor. This will continue to grow. The city, the county, the chamber, and other defendants, they can continue to fight, but we're going to do like Hal Singer in our clothes here. Now, you've probably heard this so many times. I talk about Hal Singer all the time because I think about him all the time. Hal Singer was a very famous musician from Tulsa who actually left the United States of America in the 60s so he was so disgusted with how black people were being treated here in America. Hal Singer was 100 years old. He was blind. He was on hospice. He was suffering and about to die. But he still wanted to be a part of our litigation. Hal died two weeks, two and a half weeks before we filed in September. So over the summer, I was communicating with he and his wife, Arlette, and I would always feel like I was bothering them because this guy was in the twilight of his life, he was dying, and I felt like it was like, why should I call him and be talking to him about a legal case? And I asked Arlette, and I said to her, hey, am I, I, you know, I feel like I'm bothering you guys, you know, I'm sorry. And she admonished me. And she said, what are you talking about? How will fight and will fight and wants to fight for Greenwood and what happened to his parents until he dies? And she said, you know, I'm going to send you something. And she sent me a letter that Hal wrote to the legal team that Eric was a part of and I was a part of in 2007. He sent this letter to Professor Charles Ogletree. And he talked about the devastation and the feeling when the Supreme Court would not hear our case. And he talked about the fact that our legislation that was introduced at that time had not moved forward. And he said, you know, I never believed that America would be fair to its black citizens. That's why I left. But he said, despite the fact that we will lose a lot of battles, we must continue to fight for our rights and our dignity. The survivors, the descendants, the black people of Tulsa that suffered the massacre have a right to reparations. They have a right to respect. We have a right to restitution. We have a right to repair. And we have a right to move forward with this lawsuit because the black man has rights that everyone must respect. And we have a right to dignity. Justice for Greenwood. Justice for Greenwood. Justice for Greenwood. Thank you. We'll take one or two questions, but we have to be out of here by 1030. <laughs> Can you talk about what the meeting between the survivors and the president was like and what the president's reaction was? Well, you said you told him. Hi, everyone. I am Diane Masseda. You've been watching the legal Absolutely. team the for the survivors, the last known survivors of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, discussing a lawsuit against the city of Tulsa. Now, this comes 100 years after an estimated 300 black Americans were killed and an entire neighborhood known for its successful black-owned businesses was destroyed. Those lawyers are now bringing a lawsuit and joining Joining me now for more on this is the president of the National Urban League, Mark Morial, and ABC News contributor, LZ Granderson. Thank you both for being here. Uh, LZ, I want to start with you. How significant is this lawsuit for survivors and descendants of the massacre? Um, this lawsuit is significant in many ways beyond just the city of Tulsa, but let's just start there. Just simply having this government held accountable for what happened to their families and the way that what happened to their families derailed the entire community, um, just acknowledgement alone is significant because they had been denied this acknowledgement for so, so long. But on a larger scale, nationally, we all know that race riots that occurred in Tulsa 100 years ago was not an anomaly that there are tens and tens of examples of, of cities that have suffered in similar fashions. I'll give you one quick example. Um, around the same time of the massacre, in the state of California, there was a beach that was owned by a black couple. 
That beach was taken from them by the government in California and sat empty for decades and decades before it was finally repurposed as a park. That beach was purchased by that black couple for about $1,500 100 years ago, finally, finally being acknowledged that that land was taken from them by racist motives, the council has finally approved to give that land back to the descendants of that family, which is now valued at $75 million. Just imagine what that family could have done, what that could have meant for the community if they were allowed to keep not just the property, but the businesses around that property. That was in California, which is exactly what happened in Tulsa, which is what happened in Wilmington, which happened in New Orleans and so many other cities. So to begin this process of reparations, to begin this conversation of reparations, it needs to be fact-driven. And there's no better fact-driven method in this country than a lawsuit where you get to have your words heard in court. And these attorneys are filing this suit against entities like the Tulsa Sheriff's Office, the Chamber of Commerce, and they talked a bit about uh, some of the things that they're seeking, including that a hospital be built in North Tulsa, that which was there in 1921 and they say hasn't been rebuilt, education services brought back uh, to North Tulsa, as well as reparations and monetary payments, uh, people there not having to pay taxes anymore. So they kind of listed some of those requirements. And, and some of the documentation that they're seeking, because some of the issue here is that they haven't uh, been allowed to see all the historical documents pertaining to that event. And they say that's kept them from being able to identify not only people who participated in the actual events, but also insurance companies who denied black residents their claims when they filed claims for their damaged homes or destroyed homes, destroyed businesses, and, and banks, they say, who kept uh, black clients from retrieving their own money from the banks because their IDs had been destroyed in the massacre. So you can kind of see how the attorneys are painting the picture here of how this event affected not only the people who were who died that day, but also those who survived that day and the communities that have since been paying the price because justice was never done here. And Mark, I know you were there yesterday as President Biden became the first sitting president to visit the site of the Tulsa massacre, marking 100 years since it happened. What was that experience like for you? Uh, well, first of all, let, let me thank you for having me. Uh, the most powerful part of the experience was to meet the survivors uh, and to meet family members of the survivors, along with community leaders and elected officials in Tulsa who have been working and pleading and advocating for many, many years. It is now 100 years later that uh, the American public are truly being educated about this massacre, about this, 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 this massacre, which uh, is, uh, is so horrific, uh, so violent, so uh, uh, gut-wrenching, if you think of the scale and the magnitude, an entire community, uh, individuals, their homes, businesses, and institutions, uh, a community which should have been the pride uh, of Tulsa, wiped out by a white mob. Uh, I support uh, the efforts by these lawyers to seek just compensation uh, for the crimes, really, that were committed over 100 years ago. And I think they framed it as being not only seeking justice for the victims, the individual victims and their families, but all seeking, also seeking to repair and rebuild the community, uh, which was destroyed. This was not one street. This was an entire neighborhood. This was an entire, uh, if you will, set of institutions, for-profit institutions, not-for-profit institutions, families, their hopes, their aspirations, and their dreams. And they came to Tulsa. Uh, after the end of slavery, seeking a better life, seeking to build, they did. They built institutions. They built businesses. They built a quality of life. They did it even as segregation ruled the land uh, in, in Oklahoma. So uh, the legal team, and I had an opportunity to meet them yesterday in Tulsa, uh, I think they brought together, uh, if you will, a talented group of lawyers uh, who are serious uh, and uh, thoughtful and careful and methodical 
about how they have brought this case. Uh, this case is on the cutting edge of what I would call uh, creative lawyering. Uh, and it is the use of a precedent used by the state of Oklahoma itself uh, to seek just compensation uh, for its citizens now being utilized by these lawyers and by these families uh, and by these descendants uh, and by uh, those that have been aggrieved just to seek justice in the form of just compensation or reparations, which means to repair to the best that we can some 100 years ago. President Biden, I thought, gave a powerful uh, speech uh, in terms of really educating people about people who are not aware, people who don't know about the horrific nature of the massacre, uh, the presence of the president, uh, the quality of time that he spent with the victims uh, and the survivors uh, and their families, I think was an important gesture of presidential leadership. But this work, this fight, this battle for justice goes on. Uh, Elsie made a very important point. There may have been 50 to 60 similar massacres throughout the United States in the early part of the 20th century, combined with the thousands of people who were lynched. In effect, uh, what the Tulsa Race Master Massacre indicates is that there was a campaign of domestic terrorism against African Americans, formerly enslaved, who were simply trying to enjoy the promises made by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And it was snuffed out, and it was wiped out, and it was opposed. Uh, and it is important for this country to, to achieve reconciliation on the challenges of race that the compensation and justice be given to the direct victims and to Tulsa, the Tulsa community, which was completely destroyed uh, by this. Now, the final thing I'll say, it shouldn't take a lawsuit. The state of Oklahoma, the city of Tulsa, and the leaders of Tulsa should see it in their best interest to create the Victims' Compensation Fund, to do what is necessary without a lawsuit. And I might point out uh, that the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, has agreed to a significant, voluntary, uh, if you will, compensation program, reparations program, for the family members of those that the Jesuit order uh, held as slaves uh, in the 1800s. So this lawsuit is important, but I would call on the state of Oklahoma, the city of Tulsa, all of those who are responsible to sit down with the victims and with their families and with their lawyers and to work out this arrangement so that just compensation and reparations can be paid. It should require a lawsuit because the evidence of the massacre is overwhelming. The evidence that this was an intentional act of death and destruction and murder and mayhem carried out against innocent victims who are minding their own business, living their own lives, building a community is overwhelming. It's substantial. It's clear. It's convincing that this massacre was an intentional act. The lawyers call it a public nuisance, uh, a continuing public nuisance because of its impact, but it was an intentional massacre is what we have that took place 100 years ago. So no longer can we uh, just sweep these things under the rug, pretend as though they didn't exist, say to people, why don't you just get over it? Because the pain uh, and, and the destruction is just overwhelming, and we have to come to terms, of it, terms with it as a nation. Now, LZ, as the, this legal team is trying to fight this battle once again in the courts, President Biden yesterday, in addition to making his appearance, he also announced a number of plans that he's putting forward that he says are aimed at leveling the playing field for people of color. What did you make about that part of his speech? Um, <laughs> you know, I've been a professional journalist for about 25 years now, and I think the first, my first taste of national politics was, um, as a journalist, was 
um, Gore v. Bush or Bush v. Gore, depending upon how you want to characterize it. I've had, I've heard a lot of beautiful speeches in that time. I've covered a lot of powerful people who have said very powerful things, and yet here we still remain. So while I certainly appreciate the acknowledgement, I appreciate the historical significance of having a sitting president visit the city, meet with um, descendants, and talk uh, powerfully about uh, correcting the wrongs from this day, from this weekend, if you will. Um, but I'm a little over just hearing the rhetoric. I'm a little over hearing um, about the wrongs. I want to see bold action in terms of correcting those wrongs. And I must say that as someone who's sitting here watching a Congress that is owned uh, or that, that has a majority of Democrats in both the House and the Senate, and obviously the White House, um, we have to wait, sit back and wait to see what the Democrats, of which Biden is the leader of, actually do. Not just say, but actually do. You're in complete power. I understand the filibuster can be an obstacle, but there is a solution to that obstacle as well. So I'm just going to sit back and wait to see what they do. Not what they say, but what they do. And speaking of do, the governor of Oklahoma, of which Tulsa is located, this same weekend signed a bill that basically gave President Trump a stretch of highway named in his honor. This weekend, the same weekend that we're acknowledging this massacre, the governor gave President Trump a stretch of highway. Now, what does this say? I'll tell you what it says. That President Trump, that many members of Congress have openly stated, including members of his own party, have said was very instrumental in the insurrection on January 6th, which was basically a riot, which was very, very similar when you look at some of the Confederate flags and the words that were said in the T-shirts, had a lot of racism surrounding it. So imagine the governor of Oklahoma, the weekend that we're acknowledging this horrific race riot, this massacre in Tulsa, chooses to donate or, or, or honor President Trump, former President Trump, with a stretch of highway in that very state in that very weekend. Do you believe that was a coincidence? This is the same governor who, by the way, was kicked off of the Tulsa Commission because he signed a bill that banned critical race theory. Now, what is that? Well, that is simply the ability to teach about history as it pertains to the races in this country. In other words, the very idea of teaching about a massacre like Tulsa was so unappealing to this governor that he signed a bill into law that would ban the teachings of these sort of massacres. That happened this year. So I go back and say, yes, I understand the historical significance of this moment, of this lawsuit, of President Biden's visit, of, of Vice President Kamala Harris being appointed in charge of, of, of dealing with the voting um, suppression around this country. I understand all of that. But we also have to understand what's happening simultaneously. A concerted effort to repress this information still. And you can say it was an accident. You can say coincidence if you want. I have a hard time believing that the governor, who knew a year ago when President Trump then wanted to come and visit and hold a rally this very same weekend in Tulsa, then a year later signs a bill that donates a highway to President Trump, I have a hard time believing those things are all coincidences. So the road ahead is still filled with many, many obstacles. This is certainly a lot better than where we were perhaps four years ago. But acknowledging the problem isn't solving the problem. We're still in the fact-finding side of things. We're still in the news-gathering side of things. I think it's premature to believe or to say that we're now solving or addressing when we're still fact-fighting and fighting people who are trying to repress this information. All right. LZ Granderson and Mark Morial, thank you both for being here. And we will have continuing updates right here on ABC News Live throughout the day and a complete wrap-up at 3 p.m. Eastern on The Breakdown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Macedo. Have a great rest of the day.
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.